welcome everyone to Trials and Errors, uh, this time co-produced here at the New York City Bar Association. Um, <clears throat> uh, Helen Herman, she did not say this, but she was the original executive producer for the Forum on Law, Culture, and Society, and that's one of the reasons we're here and will continue to be here in support of our friend. Uh, Trials and Errors, for those of you who've been watching for a number of years, is a unbelievably, f uh, among the many programs that we do at the Forum on Law, Culture, and Society is a very popular one. Um, we've had, uh, we've done, this is the trials of our age. So we've done the OJ case and the Casey Anthony case and the Bernard Getz case and we did uh, uh, the Jordan Belfort Wolf of Wall Street case and we did the NFL concussion case and uh, what we've done over the year. We even had uh, Larry Flint uh, for the Supreme Court case, the Hustler penthouse case, uh, the Hustler case before the Supreme Court. Um, and so we've done this over the years, and by doing so, we bring together uh, lawyers and journalists and occasionally a very super famous actress. Uh, <laughs> occasionally that comes, but we've had jury foremen. Uh, and so it's really, a, it's a fun, uh, you know, in a different program that folks does. So thank you for joining us. This uh, night was uh, largely um, inspired by Ali's death. Uh, it got us thinking again about Muhammad Ali and who he was, uh, not just as a boxer. And we realized that he was involved in really one of the more interesting, intriguing uh, cases that went before the Supreme Court. Most people don't know anything about it. People know a lot about Ali. They don't know anything about this case that went to the Supreme Court. Uh, the man, essentially, uh, because he refused induction into the United States military, uh, lost his license, uh, and, uh, and in doing so, lost th over three years of his career, his title and three years of his career. I mean, imagine if uh, Tom Brady couldn't play from the age of 25 to 28. In fact, I think that's exactly what the NFL commissioner was looking to achieve. <laughs> I actually think that's he was looking, he was thinking about the Ali case. But imagine what this was, was and we'll get Tom Hauser to talk about the impact. It's just astonishing to, to think about. Um, and we have uh, four exceptional people to talk about this. First, uh, on my far right, uh, Thomas Krattenmaker. Uh, you, in your materials, you have a fuller biography. These are these incredibly distinguished three people here, distinguished uh, practice practitioners of the law. Uh, but just for today's purposes, to simplify, uh, Tom was uh, the law clerk to Justice Harlan on the Supreme Court back in the, in the day, in 1970. Uh, and uh, he was, and we'll talk about this with some modesty, he may or may not acknowledge this, he might have been directly responsible for uh, Muhammad Ali boxing again, uh, something you'll, you will hear about uh, here today. Uh, we have next to him, of course, uh, the lovely Rosie Perez, who many people know from her many movies, my favorite of which, for which she received an Academy Award nomination and Golden Globe, is P from Peter Weir's uh, Fearless. I'm a huge fan of Peter Weir, and that was a great production, that was a great film. Uh, but uh, Rosie's also, also known as the sort of the, the first lady of boxing. You remember seeing her boxing and do the right thing. Uh, and uh, Tom Hauser did a documentary about Ali and uh, Rosie appears in that. So we have Thomas Krattenmaker, we have, and I'll, we'll hold the applause until the end, and Rosie Perez. Uh, Jonathan Shapiro, to my left right here, Jonathan was Ali's appellate lawyer. Uh, so he was the attorney that actually was representing Ali during the period of time that we're talking about. And to his left uh, is uh, Thomas Hauser. Uh, Hauser is an interesting guy, also a lawyer but also a very well-known uh, author of, um, I think, around 50 books. But he's Ali's principal biographer. In fact, the biography that he wrote about Muhammad Ali was nominated for both the Pulitzer and the National Book Award. Um, and he was also a, a friend of Ali's. And in fact, they worked on some projects together. Um, and, uh, and I just want to say something else, which is I'm a huge fan of Custis Gavras's film, Missing. And for those of you who know that film, uh, Tom wrote the book, Missing. So that's our panel for tonight, Trials and Errors. <laughs> so as we know this, if you've been here before, this goes in a pure conversational format. Uh, but let me just give you a quick summary. This is sort of Thane Rosenbaum's cliff notes of this very intriguing story and how we got to be here to discuss this. Uh, so in 1966, Ali has been the world heavyweight champion for two years. 
1964, he wins the title from Liston in Miami Beach. If you read my last novel, How Sweet It Is, you would know that. I'm just saying, you would, you would, have, you would have known that already coming in. Uh, but <laughs> he's at this point uh, in his second year as world heavyweight champion. He becomes eligible for the draft. Uh, around the same time, before then, soon after actually he beats uh, 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 Liston, he changes his name from Cassius Clay to Muhammad Ali. That's why it's Cassius Clay versus the United States. But by this point, he is Muhammad Ali. He says that he has joined the nation of Islam, and he is now a Mus practicing Muslim, and his name is Muhammad Ali. Because of that, when he's draft el eligible, he says that I'm going to seek conscientious objector status uh, under religious grounds. Um, at this point uh, in Kentucky, where he's first inducted, uh, he, uh, the D Department of Justice, which apparently was not, un not was somewhat routine, uh, conducted a, an investigation into the sincerity of Ali. They assigned a state court judge to interview people, family members Ali, and the judge actually determined that Ali's uh, objections were sincere, uh, that these, this was not a sham and that he was sincere objections that he was invoking uh, this conscientious objector status claim. Uh, the Department of Justice, however, ignored this recommendation on its own, decided to write a letter uh, to the Kentucky Appeals Board and say, forget that, we're asking you to deny, to reject Ali's uh, conscientious objector recommendation. And the Kentucky Board did so, of appeals did so, and without stating any reasons. They simply denied, rejected his claim to uh, of conscientious objector status. Uh, very briefly, there's three elements in order to make this claim. Uh, you have to actually point to actual religious texts that say you can't fight in a war. Uh, you have to be sincere in those beliefs. And lastly, though your, your objecting, your claim cannot be selective. It has to be, uh, it, it must be categorical. And what that means was, is that you, you have to say that I wouldn't fight in any war, in, in any form, in any manner. You can't selectively say, well, this war I believe in and I can fight, but another war I wouldn't fight. And so this third element becomes a key point here. Uh, the New York Athletic Commission strips Ali of his title. Uh, he's no longer the heavyweight champion. Uh, boxing commissions all over the country strip him of his title. His passport is taken away, so he can't even fight anywhere. Um, uh, at that point, uh, the gra a grand jury brings down an indictment for draft evasion. This case takes place in the Fifth Circuit. Uh, the trial goes quick. The jury verdict goes even quicker. It's a 20-minute deliberation. The jury convicts Ali of draft evasion, sentencing him to five years in prison, a $1,000 fine. Can we show that first photograph? We have access to that first photograph? Who's here for that? Uh, no one's handling it. There was a photograph for this. Uh, Aaron, is someone around here? Yeah, find out what's going on with that. Um, uh, uh, five years in prison, a $10,000 fine. He appeals to the Fifth Circuit. We're gonna talk to his appellate lawyer to see how much he was involved in that. Um, uh, the Fifth Circuit affirms the, ver the jury verdict. The Supreme Court denies certiorari, to the certiorari. For those who are not lawyers, you don't have an automatic right appeal to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has to grant you certiorari so that you can bring it up. Supreme Court doesn't want to hear it. And so that's it. The case is essentially over, except for one incredibly intriguing thing, which is that the FBI, the DOJ acknowledges that, that there has been wiretapping in this case. And this is during the mid-1960s during the Warren Court when there were far more Fourth Amendment protections on evidence gathering. And so to make sure that because of the wiretapping, to make sure that this case wasn't contaminated by the wiretapping, Supreme Court sends the case all the way back. Uh, this, it turns out the wiretapping was of Martin Luther King and Elijah Muhammad. They did not wiretap Ali. There's some conversations of Ali. The lower court says that there was uh, that the wiretapping has no bearing on the con on the conviction. The Fifth Circuit affirms, and we're back to the Supreme Court. Uh, except this time, the Supreme Court grants certiorari and says it's willing to hear the case. We'll talk a little about why that happened. Meanwhile, Ali's lawyers sue the New York Athletic Commission in civil court. 
basically saying, look, you've deprived me of a number of objections, but they ultimately prevail under equal protection. Why? Because the New York Athletic Commission could suspend you of your license if your activities somehow were detrimental to boxing. Remember, this happened with Pete Rose too, right? The, word, the language, detrimental to the sport, seems to be the, the defining language. So they determined that Ali's draft evasion and the conviction is detrimental to boxing. It turns out, however, hundreds of boxers who've done way worse than Ali engage in all kinds of moral turpitude, all kinds of violations of military orders, have done worse things, and they were able to box. And so Ali wins that civil case, and the, the court essentially enjoins the New York Athletic Commission from preventing from Ali to box. So here we are in year three. He hasn't boxed. He finally has a new chance. He has a li new license to box, but this, this criminal case is still hanging over his head, right? He has the right to box, but he could end up going to jail for five years, right? So that's the, this is the intrigue. It's an amazing story. This is all happening at the same time. Meanwhile, two months before uh, the Supreme Court granted certiorari, um, where are we positioned? What's this behind me? Where's Madison Square Garden from here? It's just there, I think. It's just there, a half a mile away. It's just here. 46 years ago last week, to give you a sense of the history, 46 years ago on March 6 was the fight of the century, Ali and Frazier, right? This was, the, this was the ultimate comeback. I think that there were two earlier fights that he had. He, and Ali loses and gets knocked down in the final round. He had never been knocked down. And Frazier wins that fight 46 years ago, last week, down the block. Um, six weeks later, the Supreme Court hears oral argument. So you can imagine, and I want to have Tom talk a little about this, how punched out Ali was at this point, right? He hadn't boxed in over three years. He finally gets his license. He's got a Supreme Court case that finally is going to be heard, and he's got a three-year, a five-year sentence against him hanging over his head uh, and a $10,000 fine. I don't think the fine was the big problem, but the, 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 the idea that he would go to prison for five years. Um, and so that's the drama of this. Uh, at the time of the oral argument, uh, Ali's face is probably really puffy from that, fa from that boxing match. Uh, and he has no idea where his future is going to be, and everything is in the hands of the Supreme Court. So, Tom, let me just start with you, because if you can help us understand, because I think it is, you know, it was a long time ago, 46 years ago. It's even longer when the case was first brought against Ali. The country at that time was in favor of the Vietnam War, and they were very much not supporting Ali's stand. Is that correct? Well, no. by, the time the Supreme, by the time the Supreme Court heard the case, the country had started to turn against the war. 1968 was really a turning point. And so people were beginning to feel sympathy for Ali. But, by, but, but when, he fir when the, ca the first case took place... When the fir when, when initially, when he refused induction into the United States Army, and it'll be 50 years this right. April 50 that he years. did it, because it was April 1967 that he refused induction. Let's not forget, you're only talking, what, 22 years from the end of World War II. Uh, people still believe, it, and now you look at the world and many people see it as divided into, you know, the Islamic world and, and the rest of the world. Back then you had the, the free world and the communist world. And if your country called, you answered the call of duty. You went in the armed forces. So there were quite a few people who condemned out. Including for, sports writers. For, for the simple act of not going in the army. And also, he had joined the Nation of Islam, which Arthur Ashe referred to as a sort of American apartheid, which was a separatist religion that ran completely opposite to the prevailing you know, integrationist view of the times. So. He was unpopular in many circles, not just with the establishment, but in portions of even and, the liberal community. And, and I read and that even really, the sports writers it was, rejected well, him. Sports writers tend to be fairly old-fashioned, but it was really his refusal to go into the United States Army that helped him bond with the liberal community and then was the platform for what came right, afterwards. Right, so that's right. 
So in, in a way, it, 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 he, that's what actually brings him into the protest movement, and I want to talk to uh, Rosie about that in, in a moment. But first, let's talk to uh, Tom Krattenmaker, because I'm wondering whether you know, I know that you clerked for Harlan, and you did not clerk for Brennan, but why, you know, if Brennan had not encouraged the court to grant certiorari, this thing would have been over. <laughs> Uh, we wouldn't even be here. We wouldn't even know who Ali was. His career would have been over. What can we speculate why Brennan said, after not wanting to hear the case the first time, why he wanted to hear the case the second time? If you tried to make a list of all the things that started off against Ali and then went for him in this case, we would be here all afternoon. This is one of them. Um, there are just dozens. Uh, the image I always have because he was a boxer, <laughs> is of a guy who keeps getting punched and punched and punched, and he's down on the canvas and the seven, eight, nine, uh, wait a minute, he's did up. we dot the I and cross the T on that? Let's hold off a minute. Boom, he's down again, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> and he just keeps crawling up off the ca canvas. Half of these things nobody knows about, like the first time when they <laughs> sent the case down. Uh, nobody knows for sure why the court granted certiorari in um, January of 1971, but we do know that only four justices voted to grant. The fourth was Justice Black. Goodness knows why Justice Black did it, probably out of a courtesy to Brennan. And my understanding is that Brennan argued very strongly that the people wouldn't understand if a person who had the public visibility of Muhammad Ali um, couldn't get a hearing in the Supreme Court. And ah. he, he sort of pushed that. And uh, I don't know whether anybody else agreed. I think Stewart and Douglas went ahead and voted Grant to Grant because they thought Ali was in, entitled to prevail. But in any event, he managed, Brennan managed to get his four votes. As if you've seen the HBO show, you can see Justice Brennan saying, all I need is four. It's just about four. And, and that was it. But at at that time, that would have suggested that he was going to lose the case, mm -hmm. even though they granted cert, because you need five votes to win it. Well, okay, so let's talk a little about the, what happened after oral argument, because there were five justices that were, would have voted to affirm the conviction, and therefore, again, we wouldn't be here. Ali would have been in jail. It was five, it was the, the initial conference of the judges after oral argument was five to three, right? It was. Uh, Berger, Black, Blackman, White, and Harlan, your former boss, mm -hmm. uh, affirming, and then Douglas, Brennan, and Stewart uh, on the other side. Right. Uh, one thing I thought we might talk a little about is the oral argument itself, which is actually really interesting, especially when you think a little about today's times. Uh, the Solicitor General made the point, remember I said one of the elements, the last element is that it can't be selective that you have to be opposed to all wars. You can't just pick and choose the wars. And so they basically said, look, he said that, Ali said he would refuse to fight war on the side of w the white people. And that's what the Solicitor General made the argument, saying he's saying he would fight for, uh, for, for Allah in any holy war under jihad, but he refuses to fight for any war uh, on the side of white people. That seemed to be the argument by the government. And that's the classic example of selective. This actually came up with respect to the uh, Vietnam War, where Catholics took a position, a moral position, that they didn't want to fight in the Vietnam War. They thought it was an unjust war. And that argument didn't work, because they were just saying, no, this is the war I don't like. I might like another war, but this war I specifically don't like. Um, what, what do we know about, let me just talk to Jonathan, about that oral argument? Uh, I mean, how did you think it went that day? Did you think that you would get more than five? Did you think, were there any justices in particular that you thought were on the fence? Well, uh, at the time, uh, I was a 30-year-old uh, lawyer at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund in New York. Uh, I was sitting beside Chauncey Eskridge, who was Ali's personal lawyer, and uh, of course, uh, I had worked on the case for, for months. Uh, we were completely convinced uh, that we were right. Uh, the, the issues were, we thought, uh, clear cut as can be. Uh, there were three grounds that a, a, a person had to establish in order to get a conscientious uh, objector 
uh, exemption. He had to <clears throat> be opposed to war in all form, uh, based on religious training and belief, and sincere. And of course, the Justice Department had rejected all of those grounds and said that it wasn't based on religious training and belief. It was based on the political and racial views of the, uh, of the applicant. It said that he, he would fight in a war. Of course, the war that he had agreed that he would fight in was the same kind of theocratic war that Jehovah's Witnesses had always said that they would fight in. And the Supreme Court years earlier had said a theocratic war is not a real war. And of course, uh, finally, uh, the Justice Department said he wasn't sincere, but there was a Kentucky judge who had heard all the evidence and said he was sincere. Uh, what better argument could there have been? Now, but the oral argument itself. The oral <laughs> argument itself, uh, Erwin Griswold, my dean from law school, argued for the government. Uh, he was a, a brilliant and and very fine advocate, and he was able to make the case, as, uh, as Thane mentions, that this was a selective, uh, selective, uh, uh, selective views on war. He only was opposed to fighting for uh, the white man, but that really w was so disingenuous, and. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, it was, it was, it clearly hit a chord among the, the, the justices of the court. Uh, they had just recently uh, affirmed convictions of, of two uh, applicants who had said that uh, they were opposed to this war because it was an unjust war. So selective mm -hmm. uh, opposition was a real hot issue. And frankly, at the end of the argument, uh, I was not happy. Okay. <laughs> Rosie, let's, let's move this to a, a different uh, topic. Um, maybe you can help us, because this is something you've given a lot of thought to, of what Ali meant in the broader culture, as a man, as an athlete, as a man of color, uh, as a religious figure. Um, how did people of color respond to him differently, perhaps? in this trial? I mean, this, in fact, may have sort of been, you could almost make the argument during the social upheavals of the 1960s that this case represented so many of those racial divisions. Right, it was an age issue um, amongst people of color because the younger people were saying, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, and the other, other people were saying, you know, Martin Luther King has, has made so much progress for us. Let's not lose that. So you're saying and Ali was identified with the more radical he, black yeah, power yes, movement? Yes, yeah, but also he, he also identified with the young white uh, 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 radicals of America at the time too. When he, uh, you know, when he was going, college kids were flocking all around him. Um, you know, and, and, and I remember um, my older cousins always talking about him, and I was telling Thomas uh, uh, this, that Ali gave them license to have a certain audacity that they didn't feel that they were allowed to have. Um, <laughs> for him to stand up in front of a camera and scream in the ring, I'm a bad, bad man, uh, you know, without any apology, that was just extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And then to stand up in court as well for his beliefs, and every time there was a camera on him, he never backed down. That was extraordinary as well. And so, and we hadn't seen that in a we, black athlete either. Or we had did, we? we did. We had, we had, we had Jim Brown, and and we and roughly the same time period, ar around the same time period. But it wasn't, he, it wasn't as pronounced as what Ali was was offering everyone and you know uh, you know his audacity allowed 
my generation to be even more <laughs> obnoxious, <laughs> you know, because that, that's all right, you know, um, you know, you know, we are we are the the fruit of the of his labor, you know, and 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 it, and it was really impactful, but it was also a very very confusing time for people of color because, as you say, uh, during that time he was preparing for the Fraser fight. And here's this man, you know, standing up for black people in America and colored people in America, and then he's calling Joe Fraser an ugly black gorilla. And, and, and it was very confusing because as a person of color, that hurts, you know, um, because even if you're light skin or dark skin, there's someone whiter than you. So you calling another person of color uh, you know, a black gorilla and, and literally having a, a gorilla doll, doll and, and beating it, it was very, very confusing. It was very confusing. So he was, he was great, but he was, he was very controversial. In his, uh, own, in his own man. I never yeah. heard that, Tom. I don't know if you had that, the interesting idea that maybe, you know, uh, Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin <laughs> were watching some of the theatrics and saying, hey, you know, this is really how you get attention. If you want to, if you want to lead a protest movement, follow Ali. Well, let, let, let's look at why Ali mattered. I mean, first, he was arguably the greatest fighter of all time. Second, every time he looked in the mirror and said, I'm so pretty, what <laughs> he was really saying before it became fashionable was black is beautiful. That's right. Third, when he refused induction into the United States Army, he was seen as standing up for the principle that unless you have a very good reason for killing people, war is wrong. Now, Ali was not a saint. And initially, when he was told that he'd been reclassified as 1A eligible for the draft and uttered his immortal phrase, I ain't got no quarrel with them, Viet Cong, that wasn't as much a religious statement, a statement of principle, as it was this was a 24-year-old guy who thought he'd put the army behind him. He'd been reclassified as unavailable for military service because he'd flunked the army intelligence test. Then they lower the standards across the board because they need more manpower. And all of a sudden, his life is going to be turned upside down. But to think that Ali was some sort of deep political thinker, I mean, to give you an idea of his grasp of geopolitics, Jerry Eisenberg, who might be the best sports writer who ever lived, tells the story of being with Ali in London during that time frame. And the people in London loved him. They were you know, gathering around, hugging, kissing, asking for autographs. You didn't have selfies in that day. And Ali looked at Jerry and said, you know, these people in England are so nice. I'll bet in their whole history, they never had a war. <laughs> <laughs> Um, speaking of politics, one last may question. I, may I add something? Yeah, yes. Because you Rosie. said about the sports writers. I just want to yeah. add that th there were uh, sports writers, a few that did stick up for him, and, and sports commentators. And one of them was one of my favorites was Howard Cosell. He, he stuck his neck out for him. And, he never abandoned and, him. Never abandoned him. And Larry Merchant, right? Larry well, Merchant, la too. La I think the and Sam Lipside, I uh, think, well, also. John, John, John Lipside and John Jerry Lipside. Eisenberg. Eisenberg. Larry sort of straddled it. There was a period of Well, that's not what he told me. Four or five years. <laughs> and I, 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 I think Larry is great. Larry is a good friend. Larry and I talk on the phone once a week. But there was a period, you know, when people were refusing to call him Muhammad Ali, and it would drive Bob Lipsight nuts because he'd write an article for the New York Times and use Muhammad Ali, and then a copy editor would change it to Cassius Clay. And Larry's way of finessing that was in his columns, he would call him Ali Baby. <laughs> <laughs> one, one, one last comment, maybe one of you can respond to this. I, I read somewhere that Lyndon Johnson was somewhat involved in the DOJ's ignoring the judge's opinion that they assigned for the preliminary investigation, that Johnson thought that this, you know, he was a bad man and did not want to see this man avoid the draft. Do we know anything about that? Well, I think that there was, <clears throat> there, there was a lot of uh, talk about both Johnson and Mendel Rivers, who was the head of the Armed Services Committee, who were dead set against letting Ali off the hook. Now, is that they, they wanted him, 
in the army. Did they want him on, on combat duty? Because let's just remember for a second, Elvis Presley didn't serve in the front no, lines. I think everybody, everybody accepted the notion that if he had gone into the service, he would have, he would have boxed. He would have done demonstrations all over the country. And, and that, of course, was one of the, the, the reasons he was as sincere as he was, because he didn't have to fight. It wasn't a question of cowardice. He wasn't worried about dying. He, he could have, he could have uh, fought throughout the, his, his time in the service, and he wouldn't have lost anything. Uh, and and uh, that was a real mark of his true sincerity. Well, but let, let's, when, when you say he wasn't worried about dying, he might not have been worried about dying in Vietnam, but Malcolm X had been assassinated after he split with Elijah Muhammad, and there's a growing body of research in recent years that really began with Dave Kindred's very fine book, Sound and Fury, and recently came full circle with Randy Roberts's book about the relationship between Ali and Malcolm X that make it very clear that Ali was afraid that if he broke with Elijah Muhammad, they could be very severe circumstances. Hmm. Um, Tom, let's, let's go back to you, uh, because I think now let's just see, let's go back to the Supreme Court case. Uh, the justices vote five to three, Oh, remember, there are nine Supreme Court justices, so you might wonder what happened to the ninth. Uh, Thurgood Marshall recused himself. He wasn't involved in this case at all because he had served as a solicitor general in some of the earlier cases uh, dealing with, the, as the case went, worked its way up the Supreme Court. So we were only going to have eight justices on this. So it's five to three. At that point, Ali's finished, right? It's five to three. They were affirming the conviction, and that's you know, what the public did not know, that it was that close to ending Ali's career. Uh, at that point, Ali, uh, Justice Berger assigns the opinion writing for the majority to your boss, Justice Harlan. And your boss turns to you and says, I want you to take a crack at the opinion. Uh, and it's interesting, I read somewhere, I don't know if this is true, which is interesting if you're a lawyer, at the time you were working on Cohen versus California, is that, did I get this right? Uh, true. <laughs> so he was, can you believe, you remember this is the case, the First Amendment case, fuck the draft, right? So, so Tom was already working on the fuck the draft case, and he's now working on Ali saying fuck the draft. <laughs> That's all you did for a while. <laughs> Your whole life is marked by the social upheavals and the draft. So uh, it was a at, way to make a living, what can I say? <laughs> so the justice turns to you, and something bothered you about this case, because he, Justice Harlan at that point was not, and I didn't hear from Jonathan, whether Jonathan thought that in the oral argument Harlan could have been convinced. And we'll, maybe we'll come back to that. I don't know if you looked at the eight justices and said, I lost these crew, but I think I might get him. Uh, Harlan was not sympathetic, uh, but just tell us briefly what happened. You, it, it didn't sit well with you. You went back to Justice Harlan and you changed his mind. Um, I, I, something like that happened, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, the principal responsibility for the case was, was another law clerk in the, in the office, and if we're handing out credit, that's really where the credit should go. But uh, the way things were done there, we were always encouraged, not only free, but encouraged by the justice to kibitz on all the cases. And I thought I knew something about this case, and it stemmed from having read the uh, message to the black man in America and from having read the autobiography of Malcolm X. Now, can you explain what that is? Because I want to talk a little about that. It's not like you went back and read the Quran. You read something else. What was the significance of this? Was it a pamphlet? By Elijah because, Muhammad. Because Elijah Muhammad was not preaching the Quran. Uh, Elijah Muhammad, I, uh, you know, Tom, the other Tom could probably tell you better, or Jonathan could. Um, I don't know how much you want to get into this. The reason Justice Douglas screwed up the whole case yeah, is because he, he thought brought this the was Quran. about the Islamic religion. Because he brought the Quran, Quran back, right. The, what Farrakhan was preaching was an Americanized, black American version of Islam. Um, and uh, so, for example, had Farrakhan been preaching the legitimacy of jihad, I don't know that, that, uh, that 
that Jonathan Shapiro would have had a leg to stand on, um, because then it certainly would have been the case that that uh, certain wars, real wars, are okay under that. So when you view. when but you read "Message to a Black Man in America," what did you discover? By reading that and by reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, I thought I could understand that. I mean, to try to make it very simple, what we had was a lot of um, rhetoric surrounding a very simple proposition, which is. We are pacifists. <laughs> we do not get involved in real shooting wars on behalf of anybody. Um, this is not, now, of course, if Allah. But there was a the language war, also that said well, Islam is is the religion of peace. That was also stated. Well, that's that is true. The Ali said that. I'm not so sure he said that in 1971, as opposed to after the World Trade Center. Um, but the I, mean, I thought what Rosie said was so profound. This is the way people heard what Ali was saying, and particularly young, young people. But there was also a legal case here. And, and Harlan was not a young person looking to be radicalized. He was a lawyer's lawyer and a judge's judge. And it's said in there, you already said this, Thane, that you've got to be opposed to participation in all wars. And the Supreme Court earlier that term had said, if your religious belief leads you to oppose some wars but not others, sorry, you're not a CO under that statute. There's a, that came up and I think Thane mentioned, there's a strand in Catholic, certain Catholic doctrine of a just war. Think back to the Crusades and some people argued that they were raised in a Catholic tradition where the Vietnam War was unjust and the Supreme Court said, well, would you have thought World War II was unjust? They said, oh, no. And they said, well, then you're not a CO. So this case was all CO, about... CO, conscientious objector. Just conscientious right, objector. Right, right. This case was all about, legally, whether he was a selective conscientious objector, that is, he just opposed the Vietnam War, or he just opposed wars that weren't being fought for Muslims, or he just opposed wars that were being fought for the United States of America, or he just opposed wars that were being fought for white people, and he made statements that could be construed that way. Each of those, I've defined these statements, I've, and the Justice Department quoted them all here in the brief. So what, what Harlan had to confront was he looks at these statements, he says, well, of course he's not opposed to all war. Um, and as Jonathan explained, that's basically what Justice, what um, former Dean Griswold argued at the oral argument. He that he said, admitted, I would fight for Allah, but I wouldn't fight for white people. Uh, he said in his brief um, that the petitioner himself stated, and these are direct quotes, he is not to participate in wars on the side of nobody who, on the side of non-believers. This is a Christian country and this is not a Muslim country. The Muslims don't go to war unless declared by Allah himself or unless it's an Islamic world war or a holy war. The Muslims are taught to defend themselves when we are attacked. And those Viet Cong are not attacking me. Why should we Muslims get involved? And all the Solicitor General had to do was read those. And I suppose what I was trying to do <laughs> was to talk to the justice about um, Understanding those statements in context, understanding that they're not made by somebody who is writing, who's a professional dogma writer in the Vatican, but is a 24-year-old boxer who maybe went to high school, but certainly doesn't have a PhD in theology, um, and that what he was trying to say uh, was exactly what Jehovah's Witnesses had said during the Korean War. I thought I had precedent on my side. During the Korean War, the Justice Department prosecuted someone for failing to submit to induction because he said that I would fight a war if Jehovah declared it. And the Supreme Court, almost unanimously, I think there was only one dissent, said that doesn't mean he's not a conscientious objector. When they say part, opposed to participation in all wars, they mean all real wars, real, wars with real bullets, real shooting, run by real men. They yeah, have said but women. that's an interesting question because what essentially happens is that you and Justice Harlan basically say, well, jihad is not a serious thing. It's an abstract thing. It's a hypothetical uh, in the- No, I was, no, with jihad, I don't, I don't mean to be pedantic with you. Elijah Muhammad wasn't talking about jihad. <laughs> he didn't say that. Uh, if jihad had been here, this would have been a wholly different case. Did he say holy war? Yes. 
Okay, so, but again, the concept of the holy war was to say in the Jehovah's Witness, I think the, the Sicarella case, I think the court says, look, there's no evidence that, that Jehovah ever commanded anybody. Oh, yes, right, exactly. Right. They never, there's no evidence, or for that matter, is there any evidence that Jehovah plans to? Right, nor so is they, there any evidence that Allah ever called Right, and so that so. they dismiss this right. as some joke. And like, that's exactly well, This that. is a joke, this is what, yeah. this is a religious joke, but it's not ultimately real. And that was the brunt of what I was suggesting, and I think it's very much like, Jonathan talked to this, what Jonathan had argued in his brief, and I know that's why he felt confident about it. So what I said, I think what Rosie said was so profound. To some extent, I felt like, here's somebody, I think, I'm 27 years old at the time. I've spent my law school years in New York City, it's where I read this stuff, and here's Justice Harlan, who is one of the most wonderful people I ever met, but next to the word patrician in, in the dictionary is a picture of John Marshall Harlan. His grandfather was a Supreme Court Justice. He took his law degree at Oxford University. <laughs> Every day he came to work with his Phi Beta Kappa pin across his uh, vest and his three-piece suit that he earned at Princeton. Um, and he was at the time, I blush to say it, almost as old as I am now. So he was generations. And I, I think what we were trying to do was to, so I, I'm coming back to what Rosie said again, it, it's trying to get the message to another generation that what Ali was doing was talking a kind of an incendiary rhetoric, but he was trying to say what you said, Thane, and what he said later on, Islam is a, is a religion. So when, when you hear that, Jonathan, I'm just curious, did you make that argument in oral argument or in the brief? Because here's what I hear when I hear that. I think that it somehow essentially degrades, devalues, dis dismisses the religious convictions of your client to say, oh, you know, those silly religions, they always talk about the whole whatever, and those things never happen, and so if they, because they don't happen, we don't take them seriously. I mean, the reality is he's saying, I would fight that war, but I wouldn't fight this war. And we've gone to the trouble to just go, I know, but that war would never happen, so it's ridiculous to even talk about it. Was this an argument that you made? One of the issues in any kind of a conscientious objective case is that it's the views of the registrant, of the applicant, that matter, not necessarily the views of the religion. And what the government did in this case was to cherry pick the statements of Elijah Muhammad, uh, to cherry pick statements by uh, some of the co-religionists, which made it sound as if the religion was one of, of, of violence, of, of jihad, whereas what was the focus and should be the focus was Ali's views, and Ali was very articulate in expressing his views to the Kentucky judge who, who heard the case, uh, persuading that judge that he was sincere in his opposition to war in all forms. So uh, what the government did was to uh, try to uh, really uh, uh, focus uh, the court on the views of the religion and neglected Ali's own statements, which were very, very strong and sincere. Um, let, let, me, you know, let me clarify this if I can, and that is a lot of this discussion was relevant to the decision as to whether or not to grant the petition for certiorari. But my understanding is when the case finally got to the Supreme Court, the judges initially voted four to four, which meant the lower court conviction would have been affirmed. No, they originally uh, voted five to three, no, and then right. they, five to three they and went then four, four to four, four because of Tom. Four. Okay, but, but, but Tom then and his, and what happened was the final decision was based on a very narrow right, we'll talk procedure about, right. of technicality, and, and that was that... Uh, but it wouldn't have started, none of this would have happened had they not come up with this other argument, right, Tom? Like, they would have never gotten to that technical side. That, that they, got them to the point it where got them. It, was it, granted. It, if anything, it just confused the court, right? I mean, it just seems to me that it, oh. it got them to rethink yeah, but, what does it mean to, to have selective participation? What does that mean? But if this case of, had been decided the, on the merits, it would have been a 4-4 split, 
and Alley would have been in jail. Because four four split would have ultimately affirmed the lower court conviction, and and not only that, he would not only have been in jail, but there would have been no opinion. There would have been no written opinion, so no one would have even known why. Right. Right. Which is even worse. That's true. Why, why don't I just jump in and yeah, clarify yeah. a couple things? Um, the 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 vote was five to three. The opinion was assigned to Justice Harlan. Everybody assumed he was going to write an opinion affirming the conviction. The other four who had voted that way would join the justice's opinion. Stewart, Douglas, and Brennan would dissent, and Ali would it would be affirmed, and he would go to jail. And you were given um, the assignment to just write that opinion. And and my co-clerk. And right. in, in any event, what, what occurred after the stuff inside the chambers is that Harlan sent a memorandum to the conference saying, I've changed my mind. I believe that he is, in fact, sincerely opposed to, uh, to fighting in all wars and that a proper standard of judicial review enables us to substitute our judgment for that of the draft board. And I think, huh, yeah, I blush. Do I blush to say this? No, I'm too old to do that anymore. <laughs> I, I think it's a perfectly brilliant opinion, and it's never been published. <laughs> and I have a copy of it, and if you're an editor and you would like me to write a book about it, yeah. bring, me, bring me the contract. I would um, like to see that. If now, you the reason it never got published is that there's this wonderful, beautiful opinion that gets carried around to all the chambers, and sometimes we'll talk about how, how all that's done, and I'm sitting there waiting for everybody to say, huzzah, hurrah, hooray, this is the best thing since Marbury against Madison, and what happened is that Stuart, Douglas, and Brennan immediately said, I'm gonna join that opinion, and then the deafening, the silence was deafening. Nobody else did, um, and one can speculate why that was the case. Warren Berger told one of his clerks after reading the opinion that John Harlan has become an apologist for the black Muslims. Um, and whatever Justice Berger believed- You mean the Oxford guy? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> the oh, Oxford yeah. guy, the, the, the uh, most uh, likely candidate right, for Right, that. and of course at that time, whatever the Chief Justice believed, Harry Blackman believed, they were the Minnesota Twins back then, so he always cast two votes. Um, <laughs> And so it was sitting there, and then as Tom said, that would mean that if nothing happens, it, it's four to four. That means not only is the opinion below affirmed, because there are not enough, enough votes to overturn it, but no opinion would be produced by the Supreme Court. Um, Justice Stewart then said two things. He said, one, I want to find precedent for finding that we can write an opinion, even when the court's equally divided because I believe that the people still voting to affirm this conviction are hiding behind the fact that they don't have to write an opinion. I thought that was an interesting statement. I mean, Stewart was said to his law clerks, I think if they were forced to write an opinion as to why they would affirm this conviction, they couldn't do it in light of what Harlan has just written. But another thing Stewart said is, I think, back to what Tom's point is, we might be able to dispose of this on narrower, what I'll just call procedural grounds that there was sort of an oversight at, when I talked about not dotting all the T, at, all the I's or crossing the T's, that the draft board didn't dot an I and, and we could get behind that. And so Stewart wrote a little opinion. In fact, I keep saying it's a Stewart opinion. If you look in the books, it says per curiam. It was written by Mr. Justice per curiam. And um, <laughs> everybody on the court started to agree with it. <laughs> Except even though it was inelegant, it, it, well, not it was, dramatic. It was inelegant, and and <laughs> didn't it say was, anything. I don't, know, I don't know if Jonathan has an opinion about this. When the court granted certiorari, they limited the grant. They said we're only going to discuss the issue of whether he was a selective CO. <laughs> so technically, what Stewart wrote, wrote was was completely outside the, the, the grant of certiorari. Although. To Jonathan's credit, he briefed that issue anyway. He didn't let himself be deterred by the limited grant so that the work had been done for Stewart. Um, the program code is TRI031617. The program code is TRI031617. Um, so there was a legal basis so, upon which to say right. that the Kentucky Appeals Court didn't state any reasons for the denial. And, a, one a thing, legal basis one that thing, I regard as fairly flimsy. Yeah, one um, thing that I, I don't, I don't like it. I, mean, I don't even, <laughs> I don't even understand. Seems to me I so why, anti. I don't know why they had to give a reason. It was so anti. It just it, seems it, like not even an answer. Yeah, so one thing that's important here is that uh, after Harlan was persuaded. 
um, by uh, Tom, who was in, then persuaded by my brief. Um, but in any case, <laughs> um, you see what's going on here. Once, once Harlan was persuaded, and Harlan was a, 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 a an important figure on the court and, and carried a lot of weight. And he, the only issue that the government was, was raising on the appeal was that Ali had a selective opposition to war. Right. And if the, court, uh, if the court decided that it wasn't a selective opposition to war, what I think many of the justices were afraid of was that the, the court would be endorsing black Muslims as conscientious objectors, and where would we get the people to fight in Vietnam? Because uh, the war was being fought on the backs of black people, many of whom were black Muslims. And I think the court was really concerned that if they adopted a, a view which gave black Muslims as a religion uh, a basis for making a conscientious objective claim, uh, there would be a real problem in, in raising uh, the people to fight the war. Because everyone would then invoke the and same. I think, and I well, think uh, that's, that's why, that, That's a, a view that you extent, can't describe to Douglas Stewart, Harlan, or uh, Brennan, because they all voted to uh, reverse the conviction. That, that's but, why But I think Jonathan's Stewart's right opinion, about the other four. Which found a way to affirm the to to reverse the conviction on a technical ground that didn't create any precedent a procurium opinion like that does really not create precedent it didn't it didn't affirm any any principle it simply said that the draft board uh, did not decide which ground it was denying the exemption on the basis of. And the government had already admitted that two of the grounds that the Department of Justice had argued to the draft board, had submitted to the draft board, that, that Ali was not based on religious training and belief, and that he was not sincere, those were in error. So not having given a reason as to why they were deciding, there was no way to know whether the draft board had based its decision to deny the exemption on an erroneous ground or on the one ground that was in contention, that is, the selectivity of his views. And that's why the court reversed the conviction. Rosie, I want to come back to you. Uh, last week, the forum, we, one of our earlier events last week was in connection with a show that's going to be premiering next week, Shots Fired on Fox. We did a night devoted to shock, shock, Shots Fired. We had the cast and, the, and some of the showrunners, the, the producers. Uh, so these last several weeks for the forum on law, culture, and society, as you can see, has really been in very much deeply entrenched in the world of racial injustice. Um, when you think of the Black Lives Matter movement today, do you think that there's a line that we can draw from this case that empowers the black? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Go closer to Mike. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> I, I truly believe that Muhammad Ali. Wait, I don't think you're wrong. Oh, I'm sorry. No, don't be sorry. There you go. go ahead. Okay, there we go. Oh. It's the first time I've been told I wasn't been able to hear someone hear me. <laughs> so, uh, so, um, I, I truly believe that it wasn't just Malcolm X. It wasn't just Mah uh, um, um, Martin Luther King. I think that Muhammad Ali was the everyday man. He wasn't well-educated. He was kind of, well, he was a celebrity. He wasn't a scholar. Um, he wasn't leading a charge. He just said, mm -hmm. this is wrong and I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and as an American, I have that right. 
And this is a black American saying that. So he gave birth to a, a new type of activism in America for people of color to have an individual activist spirit um, that you didn't have to be scholarly. You didn't have to be revered. You just had to have a belief and a conviction to stand behind. And that is exactly what Black Lives Matter is all about. It was just a bunch of kids screaming, this isn't right. You know, hands up, don't shoot, this isn't right. And, and I don't think that, in my personal opinion, that Black Lives Matter was, was intentional. It, it just happened. And I think that's exactly what happened in the case with Muhammad Ali. It wasn't intentional, just when, when Thomas and I were talking about when he first heard that he was going to be drafted and how stunned he was. You know, he didn't want to, you know, rush up the hill with a charge. He was just like, I don't want to go. I mean, seriously, it's just like, I don't want to go. And it's the same thing as like, I don't want to be shot because of the color of my skin. This is, this is wrong. But one, one of the things we heard today, which I hadn't thought about, but it sounds right, is that Ali probably knew that he, didn't fa he wouldn't face the front lines. He might have this other problem about being assassinated. But, you know, athletes historically have movie stars, athletes, they go away. Joe DiMaggio, they come back heroes, right? I mean, here was a guy that really, it, this was a real consequence to, to do what he did. You know, he could have ingratiated himself to white America, right? I mean, well, I th in, fact, Presley, in fact, I think that happened with Joe Lewis, right? Yeah. Joe Lewis went to World War II and he ingratiated himself with white America. Yeah, but Sugar Ray Robinson was a draft dodger. Right. Is that right? Yeah, oh yeah. Yes, he was. And Elvis Presley was reluctant because he didn't want to shave his hair. <laughs> it's true. But it, it, sounds, it sounds stupid, but, it, but it's true. It's, it's, he, was, he wasn't the first. But my, my point is, but is he, that he had he the gave, worst to lose, though. Yes, yes. But he gave, boy, he, gave, um, he gave, to me, he gave voice to the individual. Because even with me, as a, as a young uh, kid, growing up watching Muhammad Ali, I, I felt like I could stick my chest out and I had that right. And you don't think he was saying it as a message to, it's like the, the message to the black man of America that Thomas was referring to, Elijah Muhammad. You're saying that it may have been more personal to some degree for I think Ali. initially it started out personal. And then, and then it grew, uh, grew into a movement and that he, he got behind or in front of. And, and, and that's, that's what I'm saying, you know. And, you know, it, it, it's a special thing because people of color in America were always hesitant to step out. And, and there was only a select few. But here's the everyday guy who was willing to do it. So one of the, we're going to take some questions from the audience in a, in a few minutes, but I'm, there's two things that I'm still interested. One is the, the very unsatisfying end that we've talked about, that this decision was end, ultimately decided on some technical error, hence trials and error. <laughs> Oftentimes we focus on the error, and it, it, you know, it's not as dramatic, it doesn't make for a great TV, but in, in the end there were reasons why the court, we came up with some reasons why the court thought, let's do it in the most narrow technical way, which if you went to law school, you know this is what we do. <laughs> we find the most narrow technical decision instead of the most you know, dramatic affirmative one. Um, but it, it is, I would say, unsatisfying. If we didn't to convene this trials and error, most people wouldn't even know that these other legal issues were in there, right? Because instead you got this per curiam opinion that's just so flat in every way and so unexciting in every way when in fact the Supreme Court, it was very exciting what was going on at that time. Uh, these were white men, remember Marshall was not involved in this discussion, uh, of a certain age trying to make sense of a black man <laughs> who, was, who was just joined the Nation of Islam. It was an inconceivable and reminds me a little, we, we've had um, Sonia Sotomayor as a guest here twice. Uh, for those of you who've seen her here twice. Uh, and one of the things that I think her appointment in the Supreme Court represented was this idea of the people's judge. Mm. That there was, here was a woman, here was a Hispanic woman, a Latina, here was a woman who grew up in the projects in the Bronx, 
And there were people when President Obama nominated her and said, you know, she's a woman who has a compelling life story. You know, many people, law professors, were very upset. That has nothing to do with this. This is supposed to be about judicial temperament. But I think what we're learning, no, it has a lot to do with it because these eight men had very little capacity to understand anything about Ali. Um, and one would hope that we're living in a, in a, in a very um, different time. Let me just ask one question uh, for all of you. If, this, if the argument was being made today and we didn't have message to a black man of America, but instead we had the Quran, right? I mean, this is, you know, the, the, the argument that you made earlier, Tom, about, well, you know, these things are hypothetical, they're abstractions, they don't seem like abstractions today. Uh, Justice Douglas thought that this was really a First Amendment free exercise case, right? That you should be able to exercise the freedom of religion. And, and he thought that even Catholics who opposed Vietnam should also be able to rely on that. But I'm saying this today is an enormously different case because jihad and holy war is being invoked by certain elements, radical elements. It may or may not be representing the actual language or theology of, the, of Islam, but they're using the words, they're not abstractions. Well, if you want me to start, um, I get asked that a lot, and the short answer is we don't have a draft anymore, and we don't have a conscientious objector statute, and this was a statutory interpretation case, not a constitutional case. Um, if you, if, if you want to know if we had a war and we instituted a draft, and uh, Congress, what do you want to say, saying they did put in a conscientious objector statute or they didn't? Uh, that they put in a conscientious objector statute. Well, then it would depend on how they wrote the statute. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a Supreme Court law clerk. Yeah, you know, they, they, <laughs> and yeah. if they don't write a statute, then it depends on what you find in the First Amendment. And yeah. so far, only one justice would have found a right not to participate in a war that you don't like because it violates your scruples that only one person said that, and that's Justice Douglas. He was the only one yeah. of the... Well, because it's very hard to run a society if people get to decide whether they're going to obey laws about tax or environmental pollution or going to war all by themselves. Yeah, and very, very the, hard. The law is what the court says it is. I mean, the, the Burger Court would not have found that there was a right to gay marriage. Uh, unfortunately, we might be sliding towards a situation where Kim Davis's freedom of religion is seen as giving her the right to deny marriage licenses to gay couples. And then you get to the question, well, what if your religion says you shouldn't give marriage licenses to interracial couples? But it's, it's what the court says it is, as we've learned over the ages. Jonathan, so, um, I mean, I want maybe you and Tom to just briefly talk about your relationship with Ali. Um, was, what was his mood like during well, uh, that three-year period? Did he think he would prevail, or did he think it was rigged? Well, I think you may have gathered from some of the other remarks that, that uh, Ali was not very much involved in the actual litigation. So he didn't read the briefs? Uh, if he did, he never told me about it. <laughs> but uh, I was at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, which was right uptown in Columbus Circle, and uh, when uh, uh, Ali came to the office, it was quite an event. Uh, everybody found a reason to be in the reception area. <laughs> Everybody was out of their office, okay. and it was really, he was magnetic, and uh, it was just a, a really wonderful experience, and of course, he, uh, he was uh, magnanimous about it, and he made a, an effort to, uh, to, uh, to be with, uh, with the people. Uh, but he showed up to his, law, to his lawyer's office, yeah. and he say, this is my lawyer, and we're going to win? Did he talk as brashly as, well, as Rosie said about no, boxing? I, I, I Did he think, said, you know, I we're going to go to the Supreme Court and we're going to... I think we told him he was going to win, but uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how, uh, how assured we were of that. Um, but the other, uh, the, the other uh, uh, benefit that we had was 
uh, right before uh, or while we were working on the cases, he, he had two fights in Madison Square Garden, and we got free tickets. <laughs> <laughs> so you were there for that? For that. And, and so fact, I was there for the, uh, for so the Bonavina fight. He, the, he, he, excuse me. He did feel persecuted, right, because of that famous cover? What was, Tom, that famous cover where he had the arrows uh, oh, coming of, out of his uh, body? Esquire magazine. It, it was Esquire? Yeah. Es do you guys remember that? Yeah, there was that photo of the cover. Yeah, where yeah. he had... St. Sebastian. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thane, I might just add one point. There's a wonderful little film clip of it that's in one of the documentaries, and he's speaking, it's one of his things where he's speaking to college campuses, and he says, I'm told that I have two choices. I can go to jail, or I can go into the army. I think there's a third possibility, and that is I can get justice. Hmm. Uh, Tom, what, I mean, I, we, unfortunately we had a malfunction with our uh, photos, so I had some photos I wanted everyone to see, but one, one of those photos was of Ali on Broadway. Uh, I mean, this guy was trying to earn a living, and so he spoke at universities and colleges around the country, and I love what Rosie said, that he, he may have animated the protest movement, and given them, uh, you know, given them a whole new sense of technique and theater, which I'd never heard. I think that's an incredibly original thought. And, and you said you were right, that he was mobbed wherever he went. When he went to universities, everybody treated him like he was in Jonathan's office. But what, are the, what other things did he do? He was in, a, he was in an off-Broadway or Broadway show that opened and closed very quickly. Well, he, he was at one point in this process, he was in a show on Broadway called Great Buck White. It was a musical. Clive Barnes actually reviewed his performance favorably, <laughs> said his singing wasn't bad, but the show was. He was singing? He sang. He, mm -hmm. you, you, you all can go on to YouTube, type in Muhammad Ali balloons, and you will hear Muhammad Ali in the late 1960s singing on Broadway. Mm -hmm. uh, you can also, if, if you want something a little jazzier, go in, type in Muhammad Ali Sam Cooke, and you'll have Muhammad Ali and Sam Cooke singing together. <laughs> uh, or, or he also did a cover version of Stand By Me, although I think uh, Benny King did it better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take uh, a few questions from the audience, and then we'll say goodnight to everyone. Uh, it says, here's one. In today's climate, oh, by the way, uh, one other f person uh, corrected me. I, did I say March 6th? It was March 8th. Uh, 46 years ago, um, because they said it was, this person really knew it was March 8th. And, and uh, one, one other. Good for you, you caught it. Yeah, well, no, I didn't. I read it here. They caught it. Uh, yeah, one, somebody one, said, one no, other, no, it was March, March 8th. 8th. March yes. 8th. One other slight collection, which is yeah. uh, Joe Frazier might have been the first person to knock down Muhammad Ali in a professional fight, but uh, Sonny Banks and Henry Cooper did knock down Cassius Clay. <laughs> is that right? That's <laughs> But wait, did, but there's not, that's like a Rocky movie. He didn't also attempt to fight a wrestler during this time, did he? Well, he did. He did. Later okay. on, towards the end, he fought somebody named Antonio Inoki <laughs> in Japan. So this it wasn't, was he wasn't, this was a different payday for him. It wasn't because it was. So that was much later. Yeah, that I wonder, and of course, that would, there would have been no, uh, that, was, that was wrestling, that not boxing, and so he could have theoretically done that. Well, and that was horrible. But this but, was this was <laughs> a, 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 this was after the Frazier fight in Manila, uh -huh. and originally it was supposed to be scripted. The idea was Ali would go to Japan, he would fight Inoki, and uh, Ali would be beating him up, and he would turn to the referee, implore the referee to stop it. At which point there would be a sneak. Pearl Harbor type attack where Anoki <laughs> would pin him, setting the way for an even more lucrative rematch. And then a couple of days before the show, Ali decided that his religion would not allow him to participate in fraud. Ah. So they did it for real, and it was dreadful. Anoki spent 15 rounds crab walking around the ring on his butt, kicking out, and Ali spent 15 rounds dancing around the ring, trying to avoid getting kicked in the shins. It was, it was, it was horrible. <laughs> what, what, I'm just, just, you'll know this. What were the purses like in the, in the mid-1960s? What, what, I mean, what, what did Ali forfeit? When, when How, Ali, tens of millions? Hundreds of millions? When, when Ali fought Joe Frazier the first, the first time at Madison Square Garden, March 8th. Each, fighter, <laughs> each fighter was paid two and a half million dollars, which was unheard of mm -hmm. for that point in time. Wow. 
1971. The time right? they got to Manila, the purses had gone much higher than that. Ali got six million dollars when he fought George Foreman in Zaire. Foreman got five million. Ali got 5.45 million. But prior to that, you know, prior to Ali Frazier, if a fighter's purse was uh, Four or five hundred thousand dollars. He was doing very well. But when well. he knocked down list, listed Dempsey. in Miami Beach in '64, it was under a million dollars. Oh yeah, it was probably sure. about. Uh, I'm going to guess two fifty for List and wow. maybe one fifty for Ali. Jack Dempsey and Gene Tunney each got a million dollars when they fought each other, but that was a different era. But I mean, it goes really to Rosie's point and this idea that on principle, I mean, what he gave up it was this, you know this is these this was not pocket change. This was hu huge purses. Um, and the goodwill of fighting, you know, fighting, you know, showing up in a military uniform and said he just wasn't going to do either of it. Uh, here's from the audience. In today's climate, do you think Ali's uh, words about Islam would have given, been given due consideration? Um, in other words, because that's actually an interesting point, right, Tom? That goes back to your point. He's saying, I know now everybody knows about the Quran before only Douglas did. <laughs> so everyone knows about the Quran now. But I'm still referring to something else. I'm not referring to the Quran. When I say holy war, I'm talking about something else. This is an interesting question, whether he would have been able to say, I know you think I'm talking about what ISIS is talking about, but I'm not talking about what I'm talking about what Elijah Muhammad is saying. If, if LeBron James said, I ain't got no quarrel with ISIS, he would lose most of his commercial endorsements, for starters. Because that was the original thing. He says, I have no quarrel with the Viet Cong. They never called me. What did he say? He well, he the didn't N -word. say. They, 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 one of the things that's been misreported over the years is he's also been, you know, they've said, Ali said, no Viet Cong ever called me nigger. And in point of fact, that was Stokely Carmichael who said it. Uh, but, Ali you know, that was one of the slides I was going to show you, so I'm glad I didn't show it to you. Because yeah. <laughs> okay. that would have been false, and Ali wouldn't have liked that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have yet to see a contemporaneous quote of Ali saying that. What he did say was, I ain't got no quarrel with them Viet Cong. It's interesting you say that because with Cat Stevens, who I don't know his new name, but... Youssef. Youssef, like, he backed away, you know, by coming out in the public as, uh, you know... You're saying his career ended or he pulled away from his career as a Muslim. No, when when... when when the tensions in the Middle East started to begin, oh, you and mean, right, now currently, now. yeah, Dorn, Dorn Bush, and 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 he came out and he was, he was, speaking up for for Islam. There was a huge backlash. Really? Yeah, and then he kind of just faded back. You know, he pulled back from it. So it's interesting. Hmm, that is interesting. All right, this was a, a wonderfully enlightening conversation. I want to thank our guests and thank all of you, and we'll see you at the next trials and errors. We have. Uh, I want to thank, before we go, uh, Thomas, uh, uh, Thomas and Rosie and Jonathan and Tom. Uh, send them a warm welcome. Folks.org for our next programming, F-O-L-C-S.org. Thank you all. Thank you.